Hello and welcome to Jump Advisory Group. Welcome to our training session today, which is conducting a client visit live or virtual. As people start to uh, come in, uh, if you could please drop a note into the question and answer box or into the chat box to say that you can hear me, it'd be very much appreciated. Again, it's a, a, a reasonably busy web webinar this afternoon. Uh, so again, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you could just drop a, a little note into the chat bar, that'd be very much appreciated. Thank you, Mark, uh, much appreciated. So conducting a client visit, live or virtual. Um, over the last three or four weeks, we've been working with lots of clients uh, all over the, the UK uh, and abroad, uh, as it happens, uh, all looking at that lead up to Christmas, that start of 2021, and what's actually happening if i start to think about what's happening now in 2021 you know things are changing sort of daily as new vaccines start to come to the marketplace and you hope that we can start to control the virus a little bit better which means we've got to start to think about our client base we've got to think about what we can start to build on for next year and it's interesting that i've spoken to lots and lots and lots of clients who've all said a couple of things that you know some people are scared of business development at the moment. Some people are genuinely scared of visiting their clients at the moment. However, if we go back to what a normal December would be like, a normal December is you can't get hold of clients. You can't get hold of them because they're busy trying to finish the end of their year and because they're having Christmas parties, etc. And therefore, it becomes a real pain to get hold of clients. However, this year is going to be different because there's going to be no Christmas parties and the amount of work that they've done throughout the year will make sure that they're on top of everything already. So they'd be, they're already knowing what's going to happen in 2021. However, we don't. And therefore, there's an opportunity now, either live or virtually, we can now visit our clients. If you think you can start to book Zoom calls into clients constantly to have that conversation and work with clients, so we've got to start to think what we need to be talking to them about. So I'd separate my clients into three separate individual chunks. Those clients that are currently buying from me, those clients that are a genuine prospect that I generally want to open up, and those clients that I know nothing about. And we prioritize those that are buying from us, those that are genuine prospects. And a genuine prospect is a client that we've either worked with in the past and never placed with, or a client that we've had lots and lots of dialogue with and we've yet to do business with. And then those are not. I'd work on those first two areas first and foremost and list them, write them out and find out how many clients you have. And then what I'd be doing is targeting those clients to have a, a Zoom call or have a v physical meeting with them between now and the end of the year. So what are we going to do? And it's trying to work on that. And I said there that underneath the understanding your empire. If you understand your empire as we start to go into 2021, we'll start to understand how many clients that we need to hit our target, how many clients we need to grow, how many clients are actually going to carry on working with us, how many clients are going to stop working with us, and therefore we need to know how many clients we need to be replacing and bringing into our market, A, just to stand still, but B, to grow. And growth is what Q1 is all going to be about. If the government truly says that they can roll out and get the whole of the UK vaccinated by Easter, trust me, Q1 is going to be a huge growth opportunity like never seen before. Therefore, getting in front of your clients now, understanding what your client's doing about that growth is really important. So let's kick off. Let's get on, on there and start to move forward. So clients, I'm conducting a client visit and uh, live or virtual. I'm going to go through all the basics, all the easy stuff to do for, for, from. I go, why are client meetings are important? Okay, asking for a client meeting, how to prepare your meeting, the meeting structure, something obviously gone wrong with my little sort of uh, video there. So now what's happened there. The power of a good fact find, why testing your position is vital, when not to sell, 
what questions we should be asking during the fact find, a shopping list, what to sell, handling objections, and closing with actions. I normally do this course. It normally is a day-long course, including with lots of interaction, lots of role plays, etc. So I'm going to go through this course in an hour. Okay, so we've got to work really hard to get through this hour. Okay. And I want you to take away things that you can implement straight away. So why meet your clients? OK, and this is really important, meeting your clients. As a consultant, the benefits of meeting your clients are based on the following things. OK, you've got to start to think about creating a strong relationship with your buying clients, especially the buying point. And when I say the buying point, what I'm not talking about is the buying point that gives you the roles, the person that actually signs off recruitment. Now, that might mean we're doing a layer selling in there, but we've got to make sure that we are creating a stronger relationship all the way through the client, not just with the person that's giving you the jobs, because sometimes the person that's giving us the jobs and the actual buying point are completely different. So we've got to make sure we understand that. We've got to get a better understanding of the job specification. Now, this isn't about taking a job spec. This is about understanding clarity, understanding the company, understanding what they will need coming up in the near future and what we can do about that. It prevents confusion. I want to understand the client's environment. So if you start to think about all the clients that you've been working with, some might not have recruited with you through lockdown but saying they're coming back online. How's that business changed during lockdown? What's changed within that business? What are their views going forward? So getting a better understanding of the client's environment now is very going to be very different to what it was since we last worked with a client. Understanding what that environment will look like in the near future is really important. So understanding that becomes a, a priority for us. We need to look at what we're selling from a recruitment solution point of view. So we need to confirm that your recruitment solution is tailored to our client needs. What we've got to stop doing is going to our client and saying, that's our solution. What we've got to do is go to the client and understand what the clue solution is, and then tailor our services around that. We've got to start to establish the potential threats. What's happening? Now, we all know that coronavirus has been a huge threat to the whole industry right across, but what other threats are now happening? We've got threats from other suppliers we've got threats from the market we've got f f threats from cash flow point of view are they going to recover what's happening with our client that could potentially stop us recruiting for them next year i want to create loyalty we've talked about that engagement piece where you would first of all engage with a client and then once you've started to engage with them you start to take them to trust then to loyalty then to advocacy we've got to get and create that loyalty and that means what we've got to start to do is to create urgency with the client so we can control what's going on. And control is really important. And obviously, if they have business, we want to be able to secure that business, but on a different level, on a exclusive or retained basis. Now, when I wrote this next slide, I wrote this slide without thinking of Zoom. But we're going to start to think about how we unlock a client meeting. Why would a client actually request a meeting or why would a client turn down a meeting you know, we've got to start to think about what's in it for the client and sometimes it's not the asking but it's how we ask the question that prevents the client from actually saying yes i'm happy for that meeting what i've started to, to work with lots of clients with and when i talk about clients or i talk about recruitment agencies sometimes so when i talk about agencies okay when i'm talking to agencies what i'm finding now those that are booking calls converting that call into a video call they are converting a higher percentage of their clients into clients that are buying why because now i don't have to travel to see a client i can do it all over video and people buy from people more that they like and that they have met and if we go back to the body language conversation regarding how much of your conversation is body language how much is words how much is um tone the majority of re recruitment is all about body language so if we can sell that through a video and clients can buy that through a video then all of a sudden 
we're in a far better position. So how to unlock our meeting becomes really important. We've got to think about the closed questions compared to the alternative questions. When are you free to meet? I'm not free to meet. Compared to, you know, I'm free in your area next Wednesday or Friday for a meet if you want to meet with them virtually. Or I'm free for a Zoom meeting on this time and this time. Are you free? And I'm going to push them into a meeting. I am booked out on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Are you free Thursday? Yes, let's book in a meeting. So I'm going to ask for that alternative close. Can I come and meet you? Can I have a Zoom meeting? Generally, your answer would be no. So we've got to change that. Is I'm meeting candidates on Monday, not far from you. I'd like to call in for a coffee and understand your business better if I want a physical meeting. I'm speaking to candidates in the marketplace currently that are ideal for your type of job. What I'd like to do is have a conversation with you over Zoom or over intro, odd row, whatever that be, so I can discuss what's going on in the marketplace and impart information to you. So I'm now going to try push information towards my clients. Okay. So I want to be able to talk to them, okay? Before I brief my team on a role that you might be working, I'd like to meet you virtually via video so that I can ensure that I've captured not only the job specification, but the essence of working with you. Let's book a date in the diary now. And once I've got the diary open, if they say I'm not available that date, we can then manipulate the dates and times that they are available to push that forward. So closed questions never get you a meeting. Alternatives always get you a meeting. So you've got to make sure we start to push that alternative marketplace constantly and drive that. So we've got to work to make sure that we are unlocking, unlocking sorry, the client meeting place to make sure that we capitalize on that. So a call is quite simple, but remember they're not expecting your call. So if they pick up the phone, then that's a bonus. But if I'm expecting to have a meeting and I can convert that from being a telephone call into a video meeting, I'm so much more likely to convert that client into a buying client. So we've got to move on and we've got to start to think then. I've taken a spec over the phone, but to ensure I've got the right candidate, I'd like to visit your site either virtually or physically to get a more in-depth understanding of the business. When are you free to meet? Tuesday or Wednesday? So again, I'm now thinking I've got a meeting without a, a job, a meeting with a job. What am I going to do once I've got those meetings? So once we've got the meetings, we've got to start to think about what I want to get out of that meeting. I've got to start to think about putting my checklist into place for A, a physical meeting if it's a physical meeting, but B, for a video meeting if it's a video meeting. So I've got to start to think about certain things. So I've got to have a checklist to make sure that I don't miss anything. So I confirm everything in writing. So irrespective whether it's a physical meeting, a Zoom meeting, intro meeting, etc., I'm going to confirm everything in writing. And trust me, it's very easy to send a uh, a diary in, invite to a, can, a consult, to, uh, sorry, a, a client, sorry, and forget to put your Zoom contact or your intro contact, etc. So, location, time, date, agenda, and who will be attending is really important. Location and including whether it's a video meeting or a physical meeting is important. Time and date and agenda is important. We're going to cover the agenda quite a lot more, but who will be attending? I want to make sure I know who's attending the meeting. And if anyone in our business is also attending, that they're all invited into that meeting so people can see who's going. I want to send a diary invite to them. So I email the diary invite. This is now becoming more commonplace because more people are using video technology, but we should be doing this for every single call. I want them to confirm the invite because once I know that they've confirmed, it knows, I, well, I know that I've got buy-in from there. I want to know, I want to call the day before just to confirm, just to confirm that, you know, they're still happy, it's still going ahead, etc. If I'm going there physically, I'm going to plan my route, okay? 
if I'm going there, if it's going to be video, I'm going to make sure I've got the right content, the right screen behind me. I've got everything in the right place, etc. And I'm going to check my dress code. And dress code is really important. OK, even when I'm doing it over Zoom, do I sit here in a T-shirt OK, with a collar or do I sit here in just a sloppy workout shirt, etc., crew neck, whatever it be? You know, if I'm going to physically meet my client, you know, what am I dressing in? So I start to think my meetings now on video and face to face now become exactly the same. So I would always have business code when I'm working with clients. I always wear business attire and work from there but before a meeting I want to prepare okay but what should we prepare in order to win and it's important when we start to prepare a meeting what we're going to get out of that meeting a meeting is very different from a telephone call because a telephone call is an opportunist call because you're not expecting them really to pick up the phone but if they do pick up the phone you've normally got a, the makings of a plan but you haven't got it really set out because you're never too sure that they're going to answer. So usually, as a recruiter, we're a little bit lazy and don't do that. We should be making an actual plan every time. So preparing is important. So I want to do the following things, OK? I want to set an agenda. And I want to set an agenda for one simple reason. It sets the expectations of the client. The client knows what to expect when I'm calling. It also means I'm going to do some prep because I'm going to make sure that I hit my agenda. I want to understand the goals and objectives that I want to get out from the call. And that means I want to know what I want to achieve and I want to set my questions accordingly so I get the right information to get to my end goal. I want to have researched the company and I want to research the company for reasons. And I'm going to cover these again further in, in, in the course. I want to research the company because I want to make sure I find common ground. Because if you think you're ringing up and selling recruitment to a client, then you are absolutely wrong. Clients are not buying recruitment at this moment in time. They're buying something completely different. So we've got to understand when we research the company and we create common ground, we're going to hit one of the things that, or many things that clients are buying. So we will cover that later on. But I want you to think about that, about researching your client and the marketplace. I want to rehearse potential objections that may come up. I want to think about the object ob objections that are gonna come up and I'm gonna plan those objections. And I'm gonna shape my questions of what I want to ask before I go. So I know the questions that I'm going to ask. I want to know what answers I'm likely to get. If I get a positive answer or a negative answer, how I can spin that, flip that, work that to make sure, again, I'm driving towards my end goals. I need to know my product and my service offering. This is really important. And again, I'm going to link this back to the common ground that we want to break with our client. And again, we're going to cover this later on. But knowing your product, your service, your marketplace now is more important than ever before. So if you're sat there thinking, oh, I don't really know this type of information, trust me now, it is the information that will make the difference from opening up clients and creating loyalty in your clients than just being a common law garden bum on the seat recruiter anyone can do that you need to prepare to walk away so set a walk away point we need to be confident that we are providing value and we need to value ourselves value our own service if we're not prepared to walk away and i'm just going to drop my pants to the lowest price possible i'm just going to become a bum on the seat recruiter then there's no real need to have this meeting there's no real need to drag the client in for this meeting because you're just going to flog any old cv to them because i'm prepared to work at any price have a walk away point work from there set your target actions for the meeting so we've set goals and objectives i want to set target actions from the meeting what do i want to achieve what are those actions that are going to come out of the meeting and then i want to make sure that i've push them and i want to have a pen pad business card if i'm going there all the usual things are ready if i'm going to have a meeting okay every time i come onto these things i have a massive bottle of water ready because i know at some point i might get a dry mouth i also want to think then if it's a video call which most of these are like to be 
that I've checked my audio, I've checked my background, I've checked my lighting, I've prepared a presentation just in case they want to talk to me about something, I can put that pre presentation up and use that as a way of drawing my client further into me. So be prepared is really important. But why spend time preparing? A lot of people will tell me, well, one meeting is the same as another. Well, it's not. Every client is different and every client has a different need and therefore you need to prepare in a different manner. So we need to make sure that we are sharpening our mind. We need to make sure that as an athlete would, we train for every event in order to say, stay at the top of our games. So should we, we should be doing that every meeting. It stops us being complacent. Miss one simple thing, and it may hugely affect your ability to deal with that client. So make sure we are preparing. You can observe your client, or you can demonstrate, sorry, to your client, your professionalism. You can start to demonstrate how different you are to your competitors. It's a big chance to show the client that you are the best recruiter in the marketplace and how you can prove that. And again, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. By having a plan, you know what you need to achieve and it's what you need to achieve. So if you're going on there without a plan of what you need to achieve, you don't know whether you've been successful in that meeting or not. We need to have a structure, which means you can control the meeting and keep track of the meeting. Structure means that you control everything that's going on. You're setting expectations early. You're demonstrating how you would work with the client and control a recruitment process. So we need to make sure that we are setting expectations and having a structure does that. And remember, proper planning prevents poor performance. If you don't want to be that recruiter that never quite makes the big money, okay, then generally what I find is those recruiters don't plan. When I find the recruiters that are making big money in the marketplace, they're the ones that are planning and they prevent that poor performance by having proper planning in place. So we need to sort of take a note from what these people do from there. We get to the meeting, okay? It's a really interesting thing. You've done your preparation. So when does the actual true meeting start? And I say, if we're going to a physical meeting, it starts the journey. And I remember going on to client meetings. I still do this now every single time I go on a client meeting and I go on lots of client meetings, okay? If I look at next week, I'm out four or five times next week on different client meetings, okay? So even I am doing client meetings constantly. I prepare. So if I'm driving somewhere, I'm going through all the things that I've prepared in my mindset already. I'm going through all the questions I'm going to ask, all the objections that may come out. I am preparing as that journey starts. As soon as I step on site, I want to make sure that I am the person that they expect. So if they can see me walking down the street, you know, I want to make sure that I'm walking down the street with purpose. I'm walking down, not just suddenly walking down the street, smoking a fag or whatever, but don't smoke by the way, uh, whatever it be. I want to see if the client sees me, they know exactly what they're getting. And that's the same when you step on site. It might be a gatekeeper. It might be a receptionist. What impression do you make straight away? But what happens if we do it on video? As soon as that video starts, then all of a sudden we're on show. So we need to make sure that we've got that video starting, that we are already in charge. We are controlling the video. We're working that. How many times have I started a video conference with a client? And the first thing I have to say is, I can't hear you, you're still on mute, okay? So I'm gonna to start to use the thing straight away to break ground, to work on that. So I want to make sure that I'm doing the right things. If I'm on site, I want to make sure that if I've gone into a meeting room or a waiting room, sorry, that I'm not sat down, I'm stood up waiting for the client to, to come. When the client comes, then I'm at eye level and I can shake hands with the client or touch elbows or air bump, whatever the people are doing nowadays, okay, from there. If it's on video, I'm there and I'm waiting and I'm ready. So I'm early for the video. So that is really important. 
we should consider the journey between now okay and the actual meeting taking place if you go physically you have that little walk between the meeting uh, sorry the reception area and the meeting room you don't get that on video so we've got to create that opening conversation that opening line that little icebreaker from there and remember if we meet the receptionist or gatekeepers okay be nice to them we've talked about the waiting room with it virtual or live make sure you're ready be stood up if you've got a video have a screen or a backdrop and it's interesting as we've moved through lockdown a lot of people started with screens at the background here of, of whatever it be clients are now saying they'd rather see a natural background but what they don't want to see is your dirty washing etc etc in the background they want a reasonably clear and clean background so that first contact with the client is really important that first contact is absolutely paramount because that sets their expectations from the get-go so whether it be a handshake whether that be live whether that be virtual okay that sets the expectations from there and think as we said that journey from the meeting room to the actual uh, sorry from the, the um, reception area to the meeting room now doesn't happen on video so we've got to create that opportunity to break ice and having conversations about the platform, having conversations about how it works, having conversations about jokingly say, I must say that a hundred times a day to clients. OK, you've got your, 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 your mute button on, etc. breaks the ice a little bit. As we said, we start to talk then about structure and putting structure into place. OK, so who starts a meeting? after the icebreaker or the chit chat stops. That's all down to you. You need to take control of the meeting. It's your meeting. You need to bring it order and you start by introducing yourself or introducing what the meeting is about. So I always find if you're going to start to start that process, you know, we start to think about taking control. So you outline the structure using your agenda so even if it's a video meeting send an agenda to the client of what you are going to be covering in that meeting to make sure then you've set the expectations and you can stick to the agenda explain what your objectives are and i always use the diamond principle when i start to explain the objectives so i'm going to explain to the client that my opening benefit statement is what I've just gone through. I'm taking control. I'm working from there. I'm going to tell the client that I'm going to find out more about them. I want to know everything there is to know to help me find ideal candidates, to help me deal with some of the issues they may be having, et cetera, et cetera. I then want to understand and test their position. So I make sure I've got everything that I need. I'm then going to talk about what, how I can service the client and what work they're going to do. And then when we close, we're going to talk actual fees so the fact find now becomes the real interesting and most important part it was always before well now it becomes even more because during this part is, is where we start to discover what the clients now are truly buying but what they're going to be buying they're not telling you so it's how we sell to the client what we push forward to the client is really important and this starts to make a difference so we're going to start through what we traditionally would do OK, once we've gone through that opening benefit statement and we've broken the ice and we've set the expectations, we need to go into the fact find. And these are basic questions that we should be covering constantly all the way through. OK, so if I'm talking to the buying manager, I want to sort of open up that buying manager straight away. I want to get to know my sponsor. I want to get to know why they were there, what's kept them there. How long have they worked there? What's she like? Or, or, or what does she like working for that client? What would he like? You know, I want to know everything. What would it be like working for that person? Because these are questions about them. And they make those questions then very easy for my client to start to open up. During this process, 
I'm looking for common things because if I've done my preparation right, I might found that they've worked on other with other clients that I've worked with. They might have worked at other sites that I've, I've been working on. They may have gone to a university that I've been to. They may have gone to a school, etc. Anything that I can find common ground. This is where I start to introduce that common ground and start talking to them about those things. Because once I've got more common ground, I start to open up the client more. But once I've opened up the client and I've spoken about them, then I want to speak about the company. I want to know what the, how old the company is, the turnover, the number of staff. But mainly what I want to know is what are the company's plans for the next 12 months? Now, we understand that these plans are going to change. And we understand these plans are going to be you know, subject to lots of different things but we would need to understand what their plan is. Recruiters for too long have always thought that recruitment is a distressed purchase. The average attrition rate in the UK is between 15 and 20%, which only means 15 and 20% of people are leaving a business. So that means only 15 to 20% of recruitment requirements are a distressed purchase. The rest are all planned. So clients will still be planning their headcount for 2021 and be still trying to drive towards that headcount, but understand that the market may change and therefore their headcount may change. But if we know what that plan is now for the next 12 months, we can know where we can help them, how we can help them. And this is where the second part of the fact find will come in because we can start to give the client information that will help us, which we'll talk about on the next slide. I want to know about the manager's department. I want to understand the manager's domain. I want to look at areas of pain that we can build on. What issues has the client got? How do we cure those issues? So things such as slow projects may cost them time. Things as their clients having them a problem, not finding the right people. Staff may be a prob problem. So I need to understand all of these things. So I want to understand the number of staff in, the, in his department, the skill set, the current projects, what are their current goals? And I want to look for uh, you know, issues there. And I want to know what his expansion plans or her expansion plans are to make sure that we're pushing the right things. I want to know the company's current recruitment methodology. I want to find out how they use recruiters. I want to understand their interview model. I want to understand their success and failure. I want to know what they like and don't like about recruitment. I want to know the costs and how they want to improve their recruitment process. And I want to know what current jobs they have. But if they have a current job, I'm not going to take the job spec now from there. So then we flip into this side and this is where we start to change tack from what we've been doing for years and years and years this is where we start to become more consultative and genuinely consultative with our client and we start to think about what fact find we need to be undertaking so in this fact find now we have a slightly different thing what are clients actually buying and this is a very interesting point so i'm going to take a drink of water here just to make sure i don't choke on it So what are clients buying? And I've asked this question a lot over the last three months. And I've always then tend to get that flippant answer. Well, they're buying recruitment. Well, if you're just selling recruitment, you're missing what the clients are actually buying. The clients, having surveyed lots of clients recently, they're buying knowledge, yours, your knowledge of the marketplace, your knowledge of your candidate database, your knowledge of the client marketplace in the area, your knowledge of the recruitment trends that are happening in the marketplace, your knowledge of what's happening in that area geographically or niche from a technical point of view or an industry point of view. They want to buy your knowledge. And so if you're not giving that knowledge out when we're going through that basic part of the fact find and selling that knowledge into them by linking to other clients or linking to the marketplace and demonstrating your knowledge, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Because once a client understands that they can come to you and gather knowledge from you that will help them make a better decision, either from a recruitment point of view or from a business point of view, etc., then you're not seen as a valued client 
in their supply chain. So we need to look at that. Your network is really important. Your network now becomes more important. So therefore your CRM becomes one of your key tools of differentiation. Clients do not want to see you putting an advert on a job board. Clients do not want to see you advertising hundreds of thousands of job. Why? Because they want to see your network, the quality of your network, the power of your network. So yes, you may have a client that suddenly gives you 100, 200 jobs. And I've, and trust me, I've spoken to clients that have recently had 50 jobs given to them, had a client the other day that had 100 jobs given to them, etc. They are there. There are clients still with that amount of work. So yes, you may have to advertise when you're looking at that type of volume. But if it's just a one job or two positions in a job, should you really have to advertise that? Should your network not already cover that? If it doesn't, then it shows that you aren't the knowledgeable person within the marketplace that they think you are. So your network now becomes really important. As you said, your market intelligence now and how you bring that market intelligence back to them is absolutely paramount. All clients now are looking for any scrap of information that can help them make a better decision for their company moving forward as we come out of lockdown. They're looking for, to be able to make a, a decision that will help them move forward and isn't costly to them. So your market intelligence, the intelligence that you're taking from your candidates and from other clients now is really important. Now there's an opportunity to become a true consultant and be consultative and give that information out. You need to align your products to value. So what does a client see as value? How do you align your products to that? And therefore, when we start to talk about price and pricing our uh, services, it needs to be about the value that we can provide to the client. If the client perceives little value, then they will drive your prices down. If they see value, then they still may try to drive it down, but they won't drive it down as far, or they will just simply buy. So we need to know what the clients are buying. So what do clients want to do? This is now, again, a simple thing. So we've talked to lots of the recruitment agency, CRM providers, ATS providers, and they've gone out and done lots of research into their clients' clients to find out what clients truly want, especially the ATS, the RPO type market, because they're speaking to direct end clients. Okay. And we've got lots of data. So these are the things that they want to sort of then, and this is what clients came back and said. They want to improve their recruitment process. Now, we know that 99% of every client that we deal with, their recruitment process is broken in some way, shape or form, and yet they've never listened to us in the past. Now, if we can drive that into them properly and help them improve their recruitment process, guess what? We re reduce their overall cost of recruitment, which is on this list. They want to improve the candidate's experience through that recruitment process. Now, lots of agencies are saying, well, clients are telling me they, 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 they don't have to use agencies now. Well, guess what? In times like this, those clients that use agencies get a better service from that agency and get a better candidate from the marketplace because the number of candidates on the marketplace hasn't decreased. What's increased is the number that are looking for work. Those that are looking for work, yes, there will be a percentage of them that are good, honest candidates. The majority, they've been got rid of by their client for a genuine reason. But you're the first port of call for that start of that candidate journey. But we have got lots of information on every single client where that candidate journey falls down. So we should be going back to a client and using that to help improve their candidate experience all the way through that. We want to lower the overall cost of recruitment. If we can reduce their recruitment time, if we can give time back to the client, because that's the only thing the client cannot repurchase, they can repurchase everything else in the world, but they cannot repurchase time. So if we can give time back to their client by reducing their overall recruitment process, improving their overall recruitment process, 
it means they can spend more time focusing on the job that they have. I want to make, or the clients have told us they want to make better calls when recruiting. They want to make better judgment calls. They want to have more information. And that means due diligence on the candidate marketplace that we have is really important. So if we can provide lots of information about the candidate marketplace, then again, we're showing value. We're uplifting ourselves from our competition. And where do we get all this information from? Well, it's all stored on your CRM. It's how you extract it from your CRM. You could use things that come from the REC, from Recruiter, from all the recruitment magazines that are all talking about what's going on in the marketplace and then put that a local twist or a client twist with your market intelligence, therefore giving the client information at their fingertips, which will help them make a better call when recruiting and make them better due diligence on the candidate and the marketplace when they start to plan that recruitment. Then we start about that what's gonna impact the client. What's gonna impact the client coming down the line? We know full well contract and temp IR35 is going to impact them coming down the line. We know that diversity and inclusion is going to impact them coming down the line. We know that the emotional connections, technology and perceived value are really important. We know that emotional connections with your client creates a massive impact with them. We know that if we start to introduce technology to help reduce their time, give time back to them has a massive impact on them. And if they perceive value, they will buy. So now our fact find becomes a whole different ball game. It's not just finding about the key points of a job. It's about finding the individual bits of the business and how we can help individual parts of the business, how we can help streamline them onto certain things regarding costs. All these things now are important to clients, not just simple recruitment so we've gone through the fact find and we're driving through the fact find and there's one thing that i always say when we go through the fact find it's one big thing that we must stop doing we need to think about what we have to do and it's one big don't do not sell join the fact find i find this so often a client gives you a little in and we think that's great and we go straight down that little rabbit hole and there all of a sudden we're lost because we don't stop and get back and all the information that we need to get so if the client gives us a job let's park it to one side and carry on our fact find, carry on gathering all that information that we need, because if we don't gather that information, guess what? We're weakening our position. So we need to make sure that we stay consultative and leave the job specification until later down the line. So what we actually do when we get to the end of the fact find is we test our position. We don't sell straight away. We test our position by recapping what the client has said to us. And recapping is really important, okay? We need to make sure there is nothing that I have missed that will help me recruit or help me improve the client's services. It shows the client that you've listened. It gives them a time to recap and think about what they've said. And more often than not, you can identify things that they may have missed that are important. So if we start to recap everything they've said, so if we're taking notes, it's really important. If we're doing this over video and we're recording it, we can send that video to the client. We can review that video to make sure there is nothing that we have missed. So now we become even more ingrained in technology and helping technology to improve our service. So we need to make sure that we show that we have listened. For us, it's about creating a shopping list that we're going to sell against, what the client likes and dislikes, what the client needs, what the client really needs, okay, not what we think they need. So we create a shopping list to sell against. It also shows that we have missed nothing and we've listened to learn. We've listened to learn, but what we've done is we've then imparted knowledge to help the client learn. We've started to give the client our knowledge 
our capabilities, our understanding of the marketplace, so they can make a better informed decision. They can reduce their overall cost of recruitment by using those decisions. I want to highlight potential objections, potential ob objections with regards to what they're doing within their recruitment process, the type of person they're hiring, because I want to be consultative. Therefore, I need to challenge things. So I'll be highlighting these things that I need to challenge that they may object against when I'm going through my cell, but things that I am going to pull back and say, that part there, this is how we're going to cure that part. So I've started to highlight things that I will object against, but things that they may object against as well. It gives me time to think and formulate my cell. What's important to the client? Is it going to be a contingency sell? Is it going to be, can I sell exclusivity in here? Can I sell retained? Can I sell some recruitment services? So I need to understand all of these things. And if I know what the client likes and dislikes about recruitment, I can start to tailor my answers to ensure my sale matches my client's needs perfectly. And using market intelligence, using my capabilities and understanding of the marketplace, I can then start to create genuine true value with my client. And once I'm generating true value with my client, guess what? Clients want to buy more because I increased their appetite and their desire to buy from me. What I've not done is just leave them to think and ponder. So I'm covering everything. I want to make sure when I get to the end of my sale, yes, I want the odd objection, but I want to make sure that I've covered the major points and that objection therefore is a cry for help and a cry for information, not a downright refusal. So what type of questions should we ask during the fact find to help us fact find? Obviously we should be asking open questions, but what type of open questions should we be asking? So hypothetical questions, what if, if your end client doesn't do this, et cetera, are really important. And so once we start to ask the hypothetical questions, we then need to start asking the past test questions before what happened. What did that look like? What was the outcome? Using my market knowledge and intelligence, this is what's likely to happen now. So I'm using past tense questions and now linking that past tense question with the market knowledge I have to help them move forward. So in your last recruitment process, what happened? Oh, that happened. Let me show you how we can improve that to reduce your recruitment process or improve your recruitment process, reducing your recruitment time, reducing your overall cost of recruitment. So now I'm linking things back to what they're saying to me all the time. I'm probing. Tell me about how does that work? So I'm starting to probe tell me about those things. How does that work? What happened? I could then throw a past tense question. What happened last time when this worked? So I'm lining all these things up in my fact find and I'm giving small snippets away of my sale. Not a lot, just very small snippets so I can start to really push back. I want what's called deep probing questions and I use this an awful lot. I use this question so often. Okay, The question is just tell me more. That sounds interesting. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Tell me more about that. What happened? That tell me more question opens up your client so much and gives you so much more information. It's a real honest question. That sounds really interesting. Tell me more. You want to find more about it. And that's when you start to find the little golden nuggets that you can start to really hone in on. Those little things give you an edge over your competitors, which means that you can find candidates by design and not by luck. So tell me more, a deep probing question. And also we use closed questions to ensure that we understand and to close a subject off. So if I start to put my plan into place for my fact find, I'll have various different parts of my fact find that I want to cover. I may have 50, 60, 100 questions that I want to ask. Each will end with a closed question. So I know I've closed that fact find off perfectly. So obviously, once I've gone through the fact find, I've tested my position. I now move on to the cell. And this is where we've got to be very, very different. This is your opportunity to separate yourself out from your competition so we don't 
rush it. We need to understand our features. So your company's USPs, we need to understand the advantages because that's what brings the feature to life, what it actually does. And then we need to understand the benefits, give the client the reason to buy from you. So features need to, out, features need to stand out from the crowd. There are lots of generic features in the recruitment market and the recruitment industry. So what are your unique USBs, your advantages? These are often missed by lots of poor recruiters. The advantage brings the feature to life. It tells the client what the features do. We interview every candidate face to face by submitting before submitting CVs, which means you will only receive a candidate who's been vetted by us personally. We have spoken to at length about your company. We've solved the benefits of working for your company and they've agreed the X, Y, Z, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm giving them a full understanding. The benefits, the benefits will give the client the reason to buy from you. It explains your service and how they can judge you against others. Your features should create value when it comes to negotiating your fee, which means when we go back to that, I interview every candidate, which means you spend less time interviewing candidates who are not interested in your business because I've already vetted those candidates and removed them from the business the recruitment process, which means you spend less time recruiting. It also minimizes the opportunity for counter offer and migrates the risk of you having an offer turned down or worse still, the counter offer comes and you can't compete, which means you have to do the recruitment process over again. So it will save valuable management time and you can concentrate on your own job rather than vetting inappropriate candidates who will only be interviewing because you haven't vetted them. So we need to think about what we're doing. You know, features, advantages, benefits all the time. The benefits save time, money and hassle, and it will reduce the overall downtime the client has and give the client peace of mind. When we go back to what clients are buying, they want to buy things that make their recruitment process better, the candidate journey better, and reduce the overall cost of recruitment. So our features and benefits and advantages, sorry, feature advantages and benefits need to cover those things. We then move on to handling objections. And objections will come once we've gone through our sale of time we're not telling the price we're just telling the client what we do and i want objections an objection is a cry for help so don't ignore them they are a buying signal the client is interested but doesn't understand yet how you can help them achieve that information so you need to restate the objective and restate it properly so when we start to handle objections it's really important we do not panic the first objection that we get, which usually comes really early in the call, I tend to ignore it because if it's a genuine objection, the client will bring it up again. But usually they throw a couple of objections up there just to sort of throw you off the scent a little bit. But I tend to ignore that first objection. But if it's a true objection, they will re restate it. If they restate the objection, handle the objection as it comes. So acknowledge the objection. So it might come during the fact find, acknowledge it. Okay. And you've got a choice there. You either address it now or you park it and put it to one side. I tend, if an objection comes in the fact find, I will either, if it's a critical one, I'll address it there and then, but nine times out of 10, I'll say, tell you what, Mr. Client, I understand your objection there. Let me to put that one to one side. I'll cover that objection when I come and talk to you about our services. So I want to cover it later. So I make sure I make a point to cover it later. I don't shy away from it. I empathize with the client that they've got a problem. OK, they've got an objection. They don't understand something. So I don't shy away from it. I look at it and I bring it out straight away. I make a note and I will come back and cover it or I address it there and then. But I'm never confrontational with a client, never confrontational with a client. So I'll restate the objection and then I'll use feel, felt, found. And I use this constantly because it's an opportunity to bring in reference points from other clients that will help give peace of mind to the clients that we're currently dealing with. So I will say, 
I understand how you feel, Mr. Client. Some of my clients felt that way in the past before I started dealing with them. But over time, they have found and then I give the answer to what I see is the right thing for the service. So feel, felt, found becomes now really an interesting way of coming over your objections. I understand how you feel, Mr. Client. Lots of my clients have felt that way in the past. But over time, what they have found by using this process is X, Y, Z. It's reduced their overall cost of recruitment. It's increased their retention rates of candidates when they go into the marketplace, et cetera. I'm giving those bits that give the client that peace of mind, that bit that tells the client that I am superior to other recruitment agencies. And then what I need to do is I want to close with actions. So I'm going to close my deal now. So when I start to close my deal, okay, I'm looking for a win-win situation. So I know my goals and I know my walk away point. I'm now going to quote my deal. But what I do is I've gone through my processes. I've gone through my services and I've sectioned each individual service like, but unlike normal recruiters that will then say for our service, this, and this is all our services, this is my price. What I'm going to do is when I quote my deal is go, Mr. Client, what I believe is this position that you're looking for here actually will be better as a retained piece of business. I've gone through my retained model. And if they agree with me, I'll say, great, then my retained price is X. But what I'm not doing is this is contingency, this is retained, this is rec uh, uh, exclusive. And they go, oh, well, I'll, how much for all the I want to break it down each individual. So my contingency business is the weakest part of my business, then exclusive, then retained, then recruitment services. Now, it could be, Mr. Client, I'm looking to talk to you about reducing your overall cost of recruitment. What you've said is you want 100 people over the next 12 months. That on average is going to cost you X, Y, Z. If I can reduce that by a certain amount, would you be interested in talking to me about doing the whole lot of your recruitment on an exclusive retained basis? So I can then start to tailor my sell to them rather than just give them a price. It's about giving them value. So once I understand what they want, I quote my deal and then I shut up. Once I've quoted, I say nothing. I can guarantee you, if you speak before they, they can smell your fear. They can smell that you do not think that your offer is of value. Give it to them and let them come back to you. Because if not, they will want you to drop your pants. Do not drop your pants. We need to make sure that we stand firm. We need to make sure we stand where we should be standing. If you have to trade negotiables, we don't go from 25% straight down to 15%. We don't go from 30% down to 15%. We trade valuables at a time. Mr. Client, what you said was you really liked our retained service, but what you want to do, you don't want to pay 25, you want to pay 15. Well, 15 is my contingency service. So what parts of my retained and exclusive service do you not want me to give to you? Well, actually, I want this bit, this bit, this and this. Well, if you want that bit, then it's going to be X, Y, Z. So I trade negotiables one at a time and I look to take things away that the client truly wants then I can start to drive the price back up if I have to so I make sure I stand by my variables and once we have an agreement reconfirm it verbally and then we're going to confirm it in writing so once the clients agreed something verbally get them to agree it and especially if we're doing it over video or we're doing it face to face, write it down and make sure they've seen it. You write it down. OK, if it's on video, make sure we're recording it so there's no ambiguity about it. But write it back to them straight away. And obviously what we can use all these videos for is training to help you improve your offer and how you offer things. If you have a walkaway point and the client is driving you below your walkaway point, walk away. Do it professionally and then reconfirm it in writing why you've walked away. But when you reconfirm it, what you want to do is reconfirm all the things that the client liked about your service, the features, the advantages and the benefits, and at the end, the price, and give them the differentiation between the price. 
And I've done that quite a lot. And sometimes I find clients come back and say, well, maybe I've been a little bit hasty for that extra little bit of cash. Then, yes, I'll do that. But you've walked away professionally. You've reconfirmed it in writing, but you've confirmed them what they like and what they didn't like. And that for sometimes swings the deal. If you win the business, now is when you take a comprehensive job specification. Now, once you've got the deal written, you actually take the job spec because you could have taken that job spec back in the fact find and then you start to negotiate your fee and they don't want to pay your fee. But now I'm eager to do the job. OK, they're eager for me to do the job. And now they hold all the cards. So I never take the job spec until I've actually agreed a fee. Now I start taking the job spec. OK, that is all about gaining full commitment. So to conclude, we need to make sure all the time meeting your clients separates you from the competition. So get yourself now to meet your clients properly. We need to make sure that your meeting your client creates a stronger bond with your client. I need to make sure that meeting your client creates a deep understanding of your client's needs, desires. We need to create the common bond. We need to be able to give them information that separates us out. So use our market intelligence to separate us from ever else, other people because that's what clients are buying. Empathize with their current situation because clients are buying empathy in the bucket load at the moment. Prepare or preparation, sorry, is key to success. Prepare constantly to succeed. If you don't prepare, you will fail because first impressions count. They may have dealt with you over the phone for quite some time. This may be the first time they've actually physically met you. First impressions count. Be professional, be upfront. Have a structure that will enable you to gather information constantly, okay? And work all the way through that. So conclusion is really important, okay? You want to meet your clients because it separates you from the competition. It creates a stronger client bond. Meeting your clients creates a deeper understanding for you. As we said, preparation is king. First impressions count. That structure enables you to gather more information and control is king. Fact find is the most important part of the process. You've got your basic fact find. Now you're interlocking that with what clients truly want and what clients need to help increase the value proposition that you're giving to your client. Okay. You need to test your position before you start to sell. Sell your features, benefits that cover the client's needs and tick them off on your shopping list. Give the advantage at the end of that to why the client should buy from you because features don't sell themselves. Give them the benefits and the advantages. Once you present your options, then give your price. Do not present your price and give their options. Present your options, ask what they want to buy and then present your price. That way you are compartmentalizing each individual facet of your sale and you're getting them to buy the bit that they want. Price accordingly. And then, as I say, if you have to trade one variable at a time, get everything in writing, understand your walking waypoint and work from there. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is a sale to a client in just over an hour. Apologies if I've gone beyond your, your lunch time. So there are differences between what we've done in the past and what we're doing now. There are differences that will help you bring your client closer to you. There are things that will make sure that you understand what your client wants and we deliver what they want. Once we get this, come 2021, if you've delivered this type of meeting to all your clients and have all this information on your clients, you can start to forecast what you're like to do in 2021. You can start to see where your growth areas are going to be. You can start to see where your weaknesses are. Have you got enough buying clients? Have you got enough prospect clients? Do you need more clients that you didn't know before? What are you doing with them? What would happen? And I always play the what if question. What happens if your biggest client stops buying from you? 
What happens if your biggest client doubles what they're buying from you? What happens to your other clients? So use the what if question both ways. And once you start to use the what if questions, you can start to plan what happens if something negative happens, but what if something positive happens? Use it both ways. Then you are planning yourself into 2021. And these meetings are the start of that plan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. That's been Howard Greenwood and Jump Advisory on client meetings. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop them down to me. If you're thinking about next week's um, debate, we are talking again on selling. We'll be talking another area of selling. So if you've got ideas that you want to send me, feel free to do that. If not, I'd like to thank you for your time. Today's Wednesday. It's halfway through the week. Enjoy the rest of the week. Get closing, guys. There is a opportunity starting to appear on the horizon do not miss your opportunity to make hay while the sun shines in 2021 thank you very much guys and girls that's the end i'll see you all next week